which song of yours, when you heard it, made you cry? And I told him the answer was when I saw uh, when those three three boys unfortunately were kidnapped and, and we were still hoping that it would be there would be a, a positive resolution and, and, and there were thousands of people at the Kotel singing Achenu when I first heard that it made me cry because I felt that people connected to my song together with the sentiment of those words and that they felt that those that that music was something that would bring their tefillas closer to the Kisei HaKovot so, so it was a very powerful moment for me. Welcome back to Inspiration for the Nation. I'm Yaakov Langer, and I am so excited, the happiest time of year, to introduce the one, the only, the legendary A.B. Rottenberg. I had this conversation uh, quite a few months ago, and for logistical reasons, I'm putting it out now. But what better time than the happiest time of year to talk to someone who has evoked so much emotion in all of us, whether it's it's true happiness or, or, or real true sorrow, whatever it, is, whatever it is, the songs that we've grown up on, that I'm still growing up on, you'll hear why I say that in this week's episode, with the one, the legendary A.B. Romberg. I am so thankful to him. And and he was so forthcoming and, and so honest and raw in this interview. That's why I'm, I'm so special Lee excited. That doesn't grammatically make sense, but I'm still rolling with that. I'm excited for this conversation. Here we go. My conversation with A.B. We can all use some inspiration to help us overcome the obstacles we encounter in our lives. Get ready for thrilling conversations about struggle and triumph with those in pursuit of making a positive impact in this world. I'm Yaakov Langer, and you're listening to Inspiration for the Nation. I'm here with A.B. Rottenberg. He, uh, he's in America, which you actually grew up in. I like to be in America. <laughs> you grew up in Queens, I was right? born in New York, in Queens, and I uh, moved to Toronto in 1984, been there since. In 1984... I moved to Toronto. Like, I was married already. I had children. Got it. Okay, yes, so you, yes. you grew up in, in. I grew up in in Queens. I went to Chavetz Chaim Yeshiva system, and I actually went to work uh, in one of the yeshivas as a mechanic for a number of years in Los Angeles. I met my wife there, and then her family was from Toronto. We moved to Toronto in 1984. What and was I've your? I've been there ever since, and I love the city and the community and. You know, very happy there, of course. I mean, I'd be happier in Yerushalayim with all Yidden. Um, and maybe one day we can go and move to Yerushalayim. But in the meantime, we're in Toronto. I like that. So what was your upbringing like in Queens? What was my upbringing like? So that's an interesting question. Um, my parents were European. My father came from Antwerp. My mother from Vienna. They both escaped the camps but I still look at them as being Holocaust survivors. My father lost his, his father died before the war. His mother died in the camps. He lost a brother and a sister to Auschwitz as well, in addition to his mother. My mother uh, was able to escape uh, Vienna and get to England during the war. But again, cousins and, and, and uncles and aunts were, 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 were killed by the Nazis. And she was uh, 14 or 15 years old when she had to run away from home. So they were certainly refugees and, and, and affected by the war profoundly. And their friends and their relatives were, you know, perished in World War II. So I look at myself to some extent as being a Holocaust, the child of Holocaust survivors, although they didn't have the actual camp experience. Um, we davened in a shtibel. My father had, had some Hasidic roots. Um, he loved to sing. He loved to, uh, he played piano a little bit and he was musical. Um, my mother was, she mu she could sing well. She didn't, she, she didn't play an instrument. Um, and I grew up uh, in the same neighborhood as some Jewish music icons like, uh, like Ailey Teitelbaum, who was the producer of the Pirche Records an innovative man. He's the one who founded the dial daf way back. He was, he was a forward-thinking man, a great visionary, and, and just a wonderful person as well, fascinating person. Uh, my Pirche leader was Pesach Kron, mm-hmm. who brings so much to the world, and, uh, you know, with his Torah and his, his, his stories. 
And uh, yeah, we had a, a nice little community. That's really interesting. Yeah, it's it's different type of upbringing in the home of people who survived the Holocaust. There's a, like, it's just very different. There's a certain appreciation, just a different way of going it a, about. It was a different world. It was a different world. Um, there were many Holocaust, real Holocaust survivors, uh, people who, who'd been through the camps in the shul that I davened at. You could see it on their faces. You could see it in the wrinkles and in the and in, and in the sunken eyes. And there was a certain sadness. And even though they were rebuilding and, and, and crawling out of the out of the depths of despair, and, and life was starting to to flourish again for the Jewish community, there was a, there was a pain in their in their actions and the way they moved and the way they talked. And so we 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 grew up witnessing. Uh, you know, people who had suffered so severely. At the same time, we were in America, and life was great, and there was baseball, and there was hot dogs, and it was a whole new world that was never seen before for the Jewish people. I mean, surely we we met from time to time, you know, second, third, fourth generation American Jews, but rarely. Most of, Most of the people in our community were were people who came after the war. The majority of New Yorkers, Jewish New Yorkers, were were uh, were refugees from Europe. So it was a different world. So I know I know now, like music and that life for you is very synonymous. But when you were younger, was that as obvious? Were you always like you just mentioned before, like playing piano a little? Mm-hmm. Was it as obvious as it is now? In other words, was music as much a part of our lives as music is today for the youth? You personally, no. For me personally? Yeah. Music was a big part of my life. My father had, we had a little record player. Again, we didn't have, you know, you didn't have digital Spotify. music. You didn't have Spotify. Right. You didn't have Apple Music. You didn't have CDs. You didn't have digital music at all. Everything was analog. You did not even have, when I was growing up, you did not even have um, cassettes. Some people had big reel-to-reel tape recorders. Ailey Teitelbaum had one, and he used it more for recording than to play anything because nothing was available for sale in that format. You, you bought vinyl. So when I was growing, my father went out and he bought, uh, he had some Hasidic music, he had some Gera Nagunim, he had some Mujitz Nagunim because back in the late 50s, early 60s, some people produced those beautiful albums, Benzie and Schenker and, and Mordechai's father, MBD's father, uh, Reb David Werdiger was a chazan, and he sang beautifully. So we had those. But then when the Pirche albums came out, I was probably around 10 years old at the time. I mean, we loved them. The Pirche albums were great. They were a little simpler. They were less complex. You know, on an on a, on a old Hasidic album, you could have a 12-part f- niggin. And, right. and it was too much for any kid. But Pirche was simple, and Yossi Sonnenblick was the great soloist. And, and then there was Shlomo. The Shlomo had beautiful albums, and they were orchestral in those days. It wasn't just Shlomo on a guitar. It was Shlomo Kalbach in the early years, and, and, and they were just beautiful albums. And his songs were, were incredible, simple, easy to learn, but with tremendous heart and tremendous depth. So Shlomo was, was big, and the Pirche was big, and then the rabbis came, the rabbi's sons came along, and, and everything turned. Uh, it, was a, it was a revolution in music. You know, guitars and and uh, a folky sound and a country sound. Was there any pushback sound. from like Rabbanim at that point for that? Or I don't think there was pushback from Rabbanim. I think some people. My father would tell me to turn the music down when he heard you know the rabbi's sons playing too loud because it wasn't something that was you know that his ear could handle. And that's the way music is. Music is always going to change. My children or my grandchildren are used to listening to things that, that to me, are, are a bit foreign or a bit strange. I mean, I'm very open-minded about music. i would be the first one to admit that from generation to generation it changes. I'm trying to hang on with my finger, <laughs> fingernails, you know. It just Journeys 5 is, is an example of that, you know. I, I think I, you're hanging on by a lot more than just fingernails. <laughs> but, thank uh, you. Thank you for saying that. No, it's cool. I, I, I mean, we'll get to Journey five, Journeys 5 and, and how your music has changed throughout the years, which is mm-hmm. very innovative. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I, I want to focus on, like, 
like David Melech had a harp. I feel like you have a piano. I mean, maybe yeah. you play other instruments as well. I don't, uh-huh. Do you play other instruments? I play guitar. You as play well. guitar yeah. also. But I feel like piano is like your baby. Yeah, maybe that's I, right. I, I would do anything, you know, to hide behind the piano on stage. You know, I didn't want to get up with a guitar. With, well, yeah, I, I I enjoy the the. I guess it gives you a certain it gives you a certain persona, but it also you know hides you and. You can you can hide behind them. Interesting. I I'm not a, I'm not a very <clears throat> I'm not the outgoing gregarious kind of guy who likes to jump around on stage. Right. Right. My music was always more about the idea, the lesson, the concept, especially the English music, of course. Uh, Dvekas and Aish, those are nagunim, and I'm very proud of many of those nagunim. Uh, Malach, Achenu, these are songs that Baruch Hashem were. Uh, you know, became well known in the world, and I'm and I thank Hashem for those it blessings. Was, I, I, I'm not exaggerating. I'm not trying to be funny here. I mm. literally thought David Amela made up those tunes. <laughs> I really did, and I'm like, you be uh, yeah. Wait a second. What can you do? That's very interesting. The Rebbeinu Shalom, you know, sends down. Uh, I don't know why he picked me as a shliach for those songs, but he did, and I'm very grateful for that because it's there's no greater feeling I could tell your audience. You know, for if an artist sees his work on somebody's wall, and if a musician hears his music being played, uh, you know, he walks walks uh, walks down the street and hears somebody in the car playing his song, or going to a wedding, and you know, a chassan or a is walking down to his nigga. There's really no feeling like it. It's a sense of accomplishment. It's it's gratifying. I don't. Do I, you do you feel the need that like if it's just playing and like people look, they, they, maybe they don't know how you look? Or do you feel that need of like? I guys, I wrote it. It's no, fun. I would not identify I didn't myself. Think you I would don't say think that, so. No, but. that's my tune. That would be terrible. <laughs> that would be guy. That's not not a good. That would be bad midos. Right. What should I okay, tell okay. you? <laughs> we'll get it. We'll get into midos in, in that world. But um, so who taught you how to play piano? I'm sure there's some. Obviously, you've taught yourself how to master it a lot more. But who is like your? Well, I'm still teacher? learning how to play it. I'm still working on it. You know, you never end up end end the learning process for anybody. But I did take piano lessons as a child. Uh, I learned how to read music, but uh, mostly I abandoned that over the years, and I mostly play by ear. Uh, and uh, I picked up. I watched. I looked. I tried this. I tried that. I remember Pesach's younger brother Arye Krohn uh, showed me how to do chords with the left hand one time and you know ever since then i've been practicing and learning and watching and have you ever taught anyone how to play piano no no, no i would not uh, venture to do that no i, I don't know maybe one of the grandkids no like, no well sure the grandkids i'll show them a trick or two but right that, that kind of thing no no formal lessons or anything like that interesting yeah. so for for you there's so i i'm i feel overwhelmed because there's so many questions so many directions i want to take this but um, at that point that I, I don't know, I'm sure there was music in English happening, but I, I look to you, maybe I'm misinformed, but I look to you as one of the people who really brought this idea of like, Hey, we're in America now. And that's the language that a lot of us speak mm. and connect to. Yeah. So let's put out music in right, English. Right. So, so in, in my trajectory, so I started writing Nigunim. Like uh, Tipsukim. Uh, when I was young, I wrote. Uh, so my tw- what would be some of the songs that people would know? Hine uh, Hine Yamin Boyim was on Dvekas One, and and uh, Rachel Mavaka was on Dvekas Two. So I had the Dvekas albums, Vili Yerushalayim on Dvekas Three in 1980. So I was, I was um, getting close to 30. And I had not written one English song. I'm getting close I, to 30 and I have not written one English okay. song. Okay, have you written any in Hebrew? No. Okay. But so you're, I, you're but, ahead of me, but, but in, you're Nigin, in that world. But in really, the truth is, is that, that it, someone who's musical, someone who has musical creativity, I mean, there's a difference of being musical and having, I guess, the the ability or the interest in, in trying something new, sitting down at the piano, writing something original, I think most people can do it. Person has an ear for music and, and and knows how to sing on tune and can distinguish between notes going up and notes going down. And, and I think most people can probably write a tune. They just never venture to do it. They just don't think it's something that they can do. I, I, I'd be 
I probably could sit down with people and help them write Nagunam on their own, mm-hmm. you know, guide them a little bit, and the tune would mostly come from them. But uh, the point I was trying to make is that is that there really is no comparison when you write a, a tune to somebody else's words. If you take David Amelok's words, if you take words from from Chazal or words from 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 Tanakh or from from the Siddur, obviously. Um, it's more than uh, it's it's more than uh, I'd I'd say eighty percent of the of the of the effort when you're writing your own lyrics goes into the lyrics because you're trying to say something intelligent you're trying to say something meaningful that will resonate with people you're trying to say it in a way that's not sophomoric or or condescending and and too obvious so the writing of original lyrics is a much more difficult process and um i i my the first song i ever wrote i was i think i was 32 years old and i had written i had done many albums already so it was a, a, a process. I think I was inspired a lot to a great deal by the Magama albums, Moshe Yes and Shalom Levine. They were the really trailblazers with, with what I thought was quality English lyrics, My Zaidi, uh, Prayer Book Blues, Dollar Bill, those kind of songs. And it woke something up inside of me. I also had been involved uh, in Kiruv. Uh, to a great extent in, in Los Angeles, and I felt a need to write songs in English about Yiddishkeit because very often we would go to a Shabbaton or, or sing to kids who didn't know Hebrew at all. So you could teach them a few Lailai songs and maybe Oda Vinuchai, three words, you know, a couple of Shlomo songs. In it. But, but really to connect, you needed to talk to them in English. So I started to write. And after I was successful at doing that, I, I very much wrote and talked to people. And I said, it's going to happen. It's going to be just, just like in Europe. I mean, Europe, we were in Europe for so many hundreds of years. The Jewish community uh, came to Europe, I don't know, in the 1400s, the 1500s. But by the 20th century, they'd been there for four or 500 years. There was a treasure trove of Yiddish, of Yiddish songs and and. Same thing had to happen in English. It's funny because, like, right now it's a staple. It's like not even to me. It's like, yeah, just of course the songs in English. But I guess back then it wasn't. It was not. It was not common. Was it taboo when you? No, no. I, albums had English songs. It happened. Okay. Albums had English songs. It was very common. Mordechai had you know just one Shabbos, and someday we will all be together. But he would put out an album with eleven, twelve songs and one, one English song, and. And uh, his his songs were a little different than mine or my style. I was I was a little bit more rooted, I think, in in secular music. I had exposure to, to folk music when I was growing up. And if it's okay, can we talk about that? I'm curious. What? No, I don't know. I don't know. What What was your? I grew up with how I grew up. No, That's, okay. Yeah. I don't know. Some people. <laughs> I don't like making people uncomfortable. So yeah. what? What? Which non-Jewish music did I, you? I listened to the radio. I listened to. Uh, I think back in the day it was WMCA. I used to listen to you know. Some, it was a it was a a gentler, more uh, more. What's the word? Uh, it was it, it, secular music in those days was 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 much more uh, clean. Sure. Well, certainly <laughs> clean. You know, you, you obviously you didn't have any kind of profanity on the airwaves in those days like we have today. And there was, and it was it was it was a simpler and more wholesome time in, in the history of the United States. So you had music, and I listened to music. I, I certainly listened to Simon and Garfunkel. I loved their music. I listened to Peter, Paul, and Mary. So folk music was a big part of my upbringing. And then in later years, I enjoyed the Beatles and Harry Chapin and Balladeers, uh, Billy Joel. You know, those are, those are people whose music resonated with me. It's not like I sat and listened to it uh, with, with uh, John Denver. He would have like a, a country folk style, so those were those were people. When I heard them on the radio, I would listen to the song, and uh, and obviously it influenced me. Everybody's influenced by music. I don't care. The Rebbes, the Hasidic Rebbes, were influenced by music. How do I know? Because if you listen to a, a Gera March, and you listen to a a uh, a um, a Polish March, they sound similar, right? You know. 
a polka and, you, and Hasidic dance music, they're similar. So even the Rebbes, they heard music around them. And what comes in, comes out. So it's, it, it may, they may not have consciously uh, listened to it with, with uh, you know, hakshava, with uh, thinking about the music, but they were influenced as well. There's no doubt about it. Do you, do you ever try to imagine like what the music was actually like in the base of Mikdash or those <laughs> times? Like, what, it, what do you think it would sound like so different to us? Because I always heard, I mean, I don't know if this is a wonderful question. You know, I really don't know. I mean, people say the old Adon Ola is like a very, very old song, but it still has, it still has a European feel right, to it. Right. I don't think it's, uh, who knows? I mean, we don't even know what, how they spoke, what the dialect was in, in those days. Was it Taimani? Was it, was it more like modern Hebrew today? Was it, was it a mixture of, of Aramaic? And uh, who knows? Right. I, we, I have no clue. No clue at all. You know, we know David HaMelech had a harp. It woke him up at midnight every night when the wind would blow through his room and, and he would wake up and go learn Torah because he had his harp, harp alarm clock. Right. You know, but, but, and what that, what was David, what was the music of David HaMelech when he sang his tale? And right. It's a wonderful question. And I mean, it's Hashem. Hopefully Mashiach will come and we'll, we'll get all the old, the golden oldies. Yes. You know? Yes. We'll be able to listen. For you personally, which which um, aspect? Because I'm not going to ask. I think the classic question is like, do the words come or does the tune come? I think it depends, and I, I assume that's going to be your they, answer. It happens in, in any which exactly. way or form. I, I I I had on this recent album. I had I had the first time I think where where I had the tune. Usually, if I have a tune and I write words to the tune, that happens. I have words. And I have to figure out a tune that will work for the word. So it works both ways. This time I had a tune in my mind, but I wrote the words and I had to adapt that tune to the word. So I had both. I had the tune and I made the words, but then I had to make changes to the tunes, small changes to the tune. So it's interesting. You know, there go, it goes all ways. For, so for you, which, which part of the process is more enjoyable, coming up with the words or coming up with the tune? Most enjoyable thing is when an album is done. When you finish, when, finish, when, when you finish mixing, when you finish mixing, and you go to print, and there's you can't do anything anymore, and you say, Shepatrani, it's over. I I really can't think anymore about it." And it doesn't mean you don't think. I mean, I look right. back on on things that I released, and I wish, oh my gosh, I wish we had you know sung that one more time, or I wish the harmony had been a little different. I wish I changed a word or two. Like, can you give an example of something that you like look back and you're like, I conversation in the womb is it was on Journeys One, so I have a line called "Look around the two the two babies in the womb, the the embryos having a a, a, a dialogue as to whether or not life exists outside the womb." So look around and tell me what your eyes behold. Don't deny that you see it's only you and me. And our existence, it is empty, it is cold. So, okay, you could say I meant cold, meaning it's, it's, it's like lonely, but it's, it's not cold in the womb. So I regret having you know, written mm -hmm. that. I, I, when I sing it today, I say, look around and tell me what's before your eyes. Don't deny that you see it's only you and me without a rhyme or reason to our lives. We're both sitting here. We have nothing to do. We're, you know, my elbows in your chin and, you know, your knee is in my, uh, my ear. Yeah, it's just, there's no, no reason to our life. So that's a better line. And mm -hmm. I wish I had written that, but, but you're what, saying, what can you do? Once you seal the deal, once you publish it. your book, once you finish your art, once you finish your music and you release it, that's the way it is. Right. So uh, you can't take it back. So people should be careful and think and then think again, because it's, it's etched in stone to some extent. Are you thinking about, well, actually, this is a question I want to know. I, you don't, music's not the only thing you do, like professionally. No, it's, for me, it's never been a living. It's never it's always been, been a it's, hobby. It's always been, yeah, an, an avocation on the side. And I think that's been, I've been fortunate that I didn't have to. Uh, look, I never had the kind of voice or personality to get up and be a wedding singer or to go do a lot of concerts. Um, but I look at myself more as a songwriter than as a performer. And I, and I, I don't look at, at what I do as really being in the genre of entertainment because, you know, 
Shlomo was never an entertainer. Shlomo wanted to bring substance to people. He wanted to inspire people with his music, and he wanted them to get close to Hashem and 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 relate to to the Rabona Shalola. And he went out and he tried to find all kinds of people that he could inspire to do that. And he did. He was successful. He, thousands and thousands of people around the world are are today Shomrei Mitzvahs because of Shlomo. And I think much of the music when I was growing up and from my times, I think most of the musicians were doing it for a love of music, combination of love of music and, and, and inspiring people. But over time it became a real business because the Jewish community has grown and flourished and, and, and concerts are, are, are money makers, whether it's for an organization or a private business and, and weddings, uh, people are spending a lot of money and they're, you know, paying, you know, for, for that entertainment aspect of Jewish music. I have nothing against it, you know. People need to have wholesome entertainment and things that are worthwhile. But I don't look at myself as being an entertainer. Educator, I try to food for thought with the music. Hopefully, people are entertained with intellectual things as well. Not everything has to be superficial. I hope that people uh, gravitate towards uh, songs that are that are more meaningful and and provocative and, and thought provoking. So, no, I hear that. So, so what do you do professionally? Well, I, uh, we had a family business in Toronto that uh, I, I, I right now am no longer working there. I'm, I am retired from that, but I worked for for many, many years with uh, with uh, family members in a, a wholesale business. We imported product and sold it throughout the country. I have a son now in the business, and I still have a small share in it. Interesting. Cool. <laughs> no, it's it's. I'm not comparing us, but I am comparing us. But like with me in these interviews, it's a pet peeve of mine when like people are like, how does it make money? And I'm like, why can't people have things they're very passionate about that's a hobby and they do other stuff? Because I personally like this idea of being able, at least in the creative space, to not limit it by, yeah, if it can make money, fine. But once it becomes, at least for me, and I know there's people doing it right for the money, that's fine. But for me, it's like, I don't want ever money to dictate, okay, maybe I should interview that person or do that person. Does that, do you think that that idea played an effect in how you wrote music or what type of songs you did? Because it's not about the money. It's really about what's the best inspiring music, song, thought provoking, whatever it I is. I feel very fortunate that I never needed to, to come out with an album in order to, to survive financially. And some people do. Some people have to put out because it's that. It's. I mean, today mostly an album really is advertising for a performer, mm -hmm. right? The real money is in performing, singing at at, at events, right. and and concerts, and and the album makes them current, right? Oh wow, you know, so and so came out, which with is the so one. crazy because like mm -hmm. people put so much energy. You're saying like into, into an album, and it's like it's not even for the money. It's more like. To keep up. Well, today, is... today a little bit, you know, there is again, there was a time when Jewish music uh, particularly was suffering where, where when we moved from the analog to the digital world and people could, you know, take a CD, put it on their computer and then email it to all their friends. And right. there was a tremendous uh, drop in, in unit sales. But today, again, with Apple Music, with Spotify, with streaming. So again, we, the, 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 Composers and the singers and the producers are now, Baruch Hashem, getting some revenue from that. So I'm not saying it's a it's a meaningless revenue, but it is certainly more for the uh, persona of the performer. But I never had to do that. I never had to do that. If I if I didn't want to come out with the album, if I didn't feel it was ready before Purim, I'd wait till Hanukkah. I, I didn't care. I wasn't doing it for Parnassah. If I didn't feel the songs were good enough, I didn't feel I had enough. If I had one or two good songs, if somebody has one or two good songs, really one, really good songs, one or two good songs, and they want to come out with an album, they'll go out and find another seven or eight just to fill it up because they know they have a couple of good songs and they can't wait. They've got to be out there. I, I never felt that. So I feel blessed that I... That you know. is a bracha. We'll be right back to my conversation with A.B. Rotmerd. But first, let me tell you about a book and why it's going to change your life and what tremendous deal this is for you. You'll have a promo code, basically. Okay, here we go. Harmony in the Home. This is why I like it. I'll put in the words 
that I wrote up and then I'll speak from my heart. Every strong, lasting structure must be built on a firm foundation. If you're a builder, you know that. And including marriage. Harmony in the Home provides a Torah-based blueprint for a successful, fulfilling marriage written by one of the Gdolim of our age. Yes, Reb Chaim Friedlander Zatzal, noted Mashkeik of Yeshiva Panovich, realized over 35 years ago that young men were lacking in basic concepts relating to marriage. If it was like that, then it's scary to think what, in 2022, it's like his response was this classic work, now available in English, this book, that it, or the Safer, that addresses the ideas, insights, strategies, and guidelines, the fundamental building blocks that go into creating a satisfying lifelong marriage relationship. Written specifically for Jewish men, the author discusses the goal and purpose of marriage from a Torah perspective, understanding the different natures of men and women, the role and responsibilities of the husband, the importance of gratitude, how to create positive emotional bonds, how to foster love, giving pleasant communication, and much more. Throughout the text, the the translator also includes many precious gems from the classic work of another renowned mashkiach, Rabbi Shlomo Wolba Zeltzal. Some know him as Rabbi Shlomo Wolba. I never know, was it W or a V? Whatever it is, but you know what I'm talking about. Relating to newlyweds and Shalom Bias, these two groundbreaking works complement each other to create a treasure trove of wisdom indispensable to successful marriage. We live in challenging times in a erasive culture where marriage is constantly under attack, filled with everlasting, so this book is filled with everlasting wisdom, encouraging insights, and practical guidelines. Harmony in the home is not only it not only equips you with the ingredients needed for a joyous marriage and flourishing family life, it also fortifies you with the perspective and direction needed to thrive in such trying times. Before you get a license, you need to study, you need to take a test. A lot of people fail. I failed. And when you pass it, they let you go on the road. There's no test when it comes to marriage. Anyone could just get married. And we see so many people getting divorced. Some people in our community, some people out of our community. But it's it just blows my mind that that people could go through and they don't read this book, specifically this book. It talks about the roles for men and what you're supposed to do. And I mean, women could read it too. It's incredible. So I highly recommend you get it. I picked it up on Young Kipper and I flew through it. It's, it's, it's tremendous. It's great. And if you're an inspiration for the nation listener, you will get 10% off and free shipping when you use the code LL10. It is I would say produced because I'm in podcasts, but it's not the right word. It's published. It's made by Feltime. Their books, as you know, are always incredible. So go to Feltime.com and use the code LL10, and you could just go in the show notes. This will definitely transform your marriage, and it's 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 amazing. It's it's fundamental, and you should buy it. Go ahead and buy it. Now back to my conversation with A.B. Rottenberg. Have you ever had that that you were like, okay, this song is a banger. This is the, gonna. This is the song of the album, and then one of the filler songs just uh, took off. Yeah, it's a very good question. That is a wonderful question. So I've been surprised by certain songs um, doing better than I thought they would, and I've been surprised the other way. I thought certain songs were going to make it a lot bigger than than they did, and and. I still hold out hope for them. You know, you never give up. I'll teach you Aish, Mordechai Ben David said, and I believe in that. And sometimes a song can have a revival 30 years later. Case in point, uh, it was around 30 years ago, and it really was lay dormant for so many years, and then it was came out on an album again, and all of a sudden it took off, and the whole world sings it. Wow. So you never know. Songs can have mazel like that. But... Um, but usually, I had a pretty good idea. I put Amalek first on Dvekas 4. I knew Amalek was going to be good. Shia Mendelowitz and I produced the Leva Nefesh album, which, which had Achenu on it, and I think we put it as the second song. So, you know, you do a fast song at the beginning, and then you do a slow song, and I think we had a good idea that that was going to going to fly. I, I want to get more in depth in some of the past songs you've, you've written, and of course, I want to get up to uh, your latest album, but before that, there's so much to talk to you about, but I, I can't do an interview with you and not bring up the marvelous uh, Midas, machine. Midas machine. Right. So what what inspired you to... Having children. <laughs> That's the answer. It really? really is. I had children, and every parent tries to educate their child, but 
in my family as a songwriter. I, I thought of ideas. I thought of songs. I thought of jingles and, and, and try to instill. I mean, in my yeshiva as well, we always emphasize midos. Yeshiva Chavetz Chaim, the system. It's we learned a lot of Musar. We 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 Rashiva always talked about Midos and, and their importance and the centrality of Midos is for a Ben Torah and for a, a, a proper Torah observant Jew. Unfortunately, it's 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 not emphasized enough. And till this day, I think recently and you know in years in the re- recent years, it's become something that people are trying to focus on more and more. To, to, to the education that I had was that that is really a central, central, central focus of, of the Torah, of God's will uh, for people to live a certain way on earth. Yes, we have many, many mitzvahs that aren't related to me, those, and those are important. Uh, Shulchan Aruch is very important. But the Shulchan Aruch HaChamishi, the fifth Shulchan Aruch that is unwritten because it is so vast and so uh, infinite, and the infinite the, the the small incremental and and and, and minute aspects of, of how a person should act uh, when it comes to midos, there is no fifth shulchan aruch, but uh, it's so important. So uh, we uh, it was easy. It was an easy step. Really, it was an easy step. You know, kids complain. Uh, this one got a bigger piece of cake than me, and this one you know, was struggling to tell the truth that, you know, she made the mess or, you know, who took the crayon and wrote on the wall. And so having children and growing up with that was, uh, and and with them growing up in a, I guess, in a songwriter's house. So I was able to think of these ideas. And and then we made the story around it just to make a vehicle to get the songs out and how how a song and even thinking, uh, hearing hearing certain words at a certain time could possibly impact behavior you know it's not a permanent fix but it certainly helped people meet us alert you know something that they would what you got you you got i think you it's like a product now right There's today like- yes it's a product somebody somebody went and and, and licensed it with us and they it's a little button you push yeah and there, and there are six songs where you can play certain songs yeah cute cute item that's so interesting yeah because like today like the you know, there's Mordechai Shapiro, there's Ben Shapiro, but Schnooki Shapiro, he's the original oh, Shapiro. he's the original Shapiro. Yeah, he's the original Gavaldic, one. I love that. So I have to tell Mordechai that. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I'll listen, who knows. But um, it, something that I, I like find interesting you is... You should call me Uncle Schnooki. <laughs> Uncle Schnooki. I find interesting is that like with children's... And now, you know, actually... Was Uncle Moshe around when that came out? Yes, Uncle Moshe was, was around, around beforehand. Okay. There, were, there were several other good. Uh, so you had Uncle- and Tuki were around. Okay. Uncle Moshe was, uh, but they they focused on mitzvahs and 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 uh, Kivi and Tuki were wild and crazy stuff, but also focused on certain mitzvahs and behaviors. But there-, there are aspects of Midos and Uncle Moshe, and there are aspects of of Midos in the, in the in the Kivi and Tuki and and in the Torah Avenue and all those other. Uh, children's products that were out before me. And there is also aspects of mitzvahs on the Midos machine, but we're more focused on 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 Midos, or the way we act, how we think and feel. It's interesting because like those, let's Uncle Maishi or Kevin Tuki or even, you know, Sesame Street or whatnot, mm-hmm. it was a lot lighter. Like if someone listen, like I was like recently listening and I'm like, it, there are some very scary and like dark concepts in there. Well, Moshe yes, Moshe yes, Oliver Shalom was was my partner on the first marvelous Midas machine. We were both living in Toronto at the time, and I was teaching half a day, and I would come home uh, on the way home. His, he, he lived halfway between the school where I taught and and where I lived, and I would stop off at his house. And for one winter, I would go there every day, and for two three hours, we would sit and toss ideas about this marvelous Midos machine. And Moshe very much believed in in uh, the Hollywood style. He said, our kids could handle a, <laughs> an evil character. And I was fighting. I said, no. I said, you know, soften them up. So we ended up compromising, you know. So he would say, Dr. Doomstein. And, and I would have, like Dizzy say, Dr. Dooms Blatt, just to like soften, to it, soften it and make it like, you know, like he wasn't scared of him, so you shouldn't be scared ah. of him either and that kind of thing. So we had a little bit of a, of a, we had to compromise with each other. I, I allowed, you know, the character to be there and at the same time softening the, the impact because our kids weren't as used to the, you know, the Wicked Witch of the West or the, uh, 
or the queen, uh, you know, the mirror, mirror on the wall from Snow White. So uh, it, it was interesting. It was an interesting time. So I know, well, one thing is that, that I want to ask is there's not as many per- performances or shows that, like I would anticipate you'd be doing more shows like, okay, they make, they could make good money good, and stuff like that. But there's shows not- Shows for children, you mean? No, sorry. I'm I'm okay. I'm on to I'm back to music. I'm back, back to, to music. regular music. Back okay. to regular music, but there, are, you, you, I don't know. There's maybe once or twice a year. You know, like I know you're very involved uh, with Hask. Um, yeah, I did. A, I did a lot of Hask shows, but I wrote some songs for the organization. I'm very, very close to the to the people who run it. Very, very close. Is there a story there, or just um, just just who cannot love right. what Hask does and 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 the children they take in and the, and the break that they give to the parents who struggle with with children with needs uh, all year round and 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 the the beautiful spirit and and work that goes on in the camp it's very inspiring and i i wrote a number of songs a small piece of heaven who am i uh, one candle uh, even one or two other you know little pieces for them over the years i was fortunate it's not easy to write songs for organizations and sometimes the ideas come and hask uh, hask and i were somehow the rabbon shalom sent some good ideas so i've performed for them and when i'm there i usually do a song or two of you know from my repertoire i do do some you know i do do some kumzits and i'll, I'll do a kumzits uh I love to do them. I love to sing Hebrew songs and certainly some of my songs in a relaxed atmosphere, you know, Hever singing along where it's not, you know, where uh, on stage, you know, with uh, with lights and, and big orchestras and those Does are that, much like, more complicated. Does that freak you out a little? Or when I first started going when I first appeared on stage, I was I was very nervous getting on stage. I also you know, people are paying money to come and hear me. I better get it right. I right. better rehearse. I better. So I spent a lot of time preparing. I'm I'm less nervous now. I've done it often, and I've been trying to zayda. You know, I'm a zayda, so you know, who cares? Right. <laughs> <laughs> right. There, there are greater and more important things in life, and there you go. Okay, so I want to. I have a list here of songs that I want to go into and, and I don't want to take away we have a sister podcast Living L'chaim, uh The Spirit of the Song with Donnie Kunstler which okay. which you've, you've been on um, which I don't know if you remember whatever it was a while ago it was Either, a long time ago not that long ago uh-huh. but but um, so maybe one day you you and him will sit down but I, I want to get a taste of some of the songs I'm going to I'm going to list a few of the songs that to me come to mind um, obviously there's Hamalach and Achenu Mama Rachel Place where I belong. It's mm-hmm. time to say Gachavis, Joe DiMaggio's card, Atheist mm-hmm. Convention in LA, uh, Nishamala, the man from Vilna, and Memories. I want to like, we definitely don't have time to go into all of these. But, well, you know, before I even get to that, I'm jumping around here, but do you have a favorite uh-huh. song that means the most? I don't. To you? No. I don't. I, 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 I wouldn't know where to start. So let me rephrase that because yeah. if, if, God forbid, that you're going to only have one or you're going to have two songs that that everything's getting erased and the next generation is going to have two songs, one in English and one in Hebrew. Which two songs would you pick? I wouldn't know. I really would You have 10 seconds and there's... I would not know what to oh, do. Okay. I would not. Well, I'd say let the cards fall where they may. I have no idea. Right, okay, fine. You know. Um, but I want to go, let's say like the song like Memories. Uh, what year was that? Memories is on Journeys 2. So that was 1980. 80 something, 88, 86, 87, I don't remember. It's a little scary that you kind of foresaw this idea of. of the last survivor. Yeah, it's, it, we're living. I mean, I'm doing these, I'm trying to hop around as many Holocaust survivors as I can. And it, it, the world. I don't think it took any kind of great intelligence to realize that as time goes on, the people are going to pass away. That's the way of the world. It's the way HaKadosh Baruch Hu decided to. Uh, to um, to create the society we live in. You know, we don't live forever. So there was certainly going to be a day when the last survivor would fade away. So, but, but, but it was a song that I struggled with. It took me a long time. It's a song that I'm very close to. Is it my favorite song? I don't know, but it's a song I put in a lot of time and effort thinking about. Um, I even had some help. I reached out to a, to a family friend who was a, a gifted songwriter, uh, and she helped me with some of the words, and but but 
until I came up with the line at the end, uh, I know that God in heaven won't forget, I really didn't know how to, how do you talk about the Holocaust? And, and what is the comfort for Klal Yisrael that, that, that because there really is no answer, what will become of all the memories? And the memories are gone. And I'm not talking about remembering the Holocaust. People misunderstand the meaning of the song. They think I'm talking about Holocaust remembrance. Holocaust remembrance is a given. We must remember not only the Holocaust, we remember the Chorban, we remember all of the tragedies that befell Klal Yisrael, and certainly that was, if not the worst, certainly one of the worst. So what will become of all the memories is, is simply that the idea that nobody has memories. The father was killed in the war. The mother was killed in the war. The grandparents were gone in the war. The children were gone in the war. There are no pictures. There is no memorabilia. Yes, you can go to Yad Vashem and, and, and there are hundreds of thousands of pictures, but there are hundreds of thousand more that, that we don't see and we don't have and we don't know of. What will become of those memories? What will become of all the memories that we have no way of remembering? And that's the message in the song. And then finally, when I came up with the, the line of, I know that God in heaven won't forget, I felt a personal nechama, that the words comforted me. And then I was able to, to sing that song and pass it on. So on the way here, um, I, I had the opportunity to listen to Journeys 5, but I didn't. I said I want to listen to to the songs that I grew up with. And I was just, I'm just, I was just crying my eyes out. Well, listen, Yaakov, I can tell you, yeah. you're a young man. You're still growing up. Yeah. So when you listen to Journeys Five, hopefully ten years from now, you'll say I grew up with the oh, with okay. that album as I'm well. <laughs> I'm in. But I, I was listening to Nishama La on the way uh -huh. here, and I was just, I met people next to me thought I was crazy. I'm like, I don't care. I'm just gonna uh -huh. ball out and uh -huh. tap into those words. Where did that idea come from? I don't from? think it's such a. Uh, uh, um, I don't think it's a revelation. I, it, it's the story of, of uh, every child, every every yid, every 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 Jew who who learns about Torah and mitzvahs learns the story of neshama that we're born, that we come down as a neshama from Shemayim. We're, placed, there's a, there's we're a, placed in a body. We live our life, and we live, and we we either do good or we don't do good, and 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 then when it's time to go, we don't want to go. Uh, to me, it, it, it was not really a, a, a brainstorm of an idea. It was a simple idea, and, and Baruch Hashem, the combination of music and words, you know, resonates with people. But I, I don't look at it as being any kind of. Great. No, I don't think it's a revelation. But it's to me, what's very interesting is that we have so much Taira and Chesed, and what to me is like that song is is the ability to give over all of that in like an emotional way, which is... Well, I know many people are comforted by it, especially if they lose lose someone close to them. And they it, it reinforces the fact that we we live for a short period of time, we go on to a better place, you were in the place right by the throne. So it, it's, it's a story of transition. You know, people ask me, why did you call the album Journeys? And, and, and I didn't have a name. I had songs back in 1984 when the first album was. And I had a story of a Sefer Torah that came from Kiev and it traveled. But then I realized that there's also the boys from the bums from the east side who became more interested in learning Torah after they got to, to love their Rebbe because he played ball with them. Or, or, or uh, there's no place like home. You know, the Yid who first tried out, you know, Harry Krishna, and he went to the Christian, and then he went to Eretz Yisrael, and he found Torah. So there's transition, ride the train, you go, you move, you, and, and the Shamal is the same kind of an idea. So it's very consistent with the, with the title of the album. And uh, uh, Baruch Hashem, it's a song that, that resonates with people, and I'm very grateful. Okay, I want to move on to uh, Joe DiMaggio's card. Which so transition, change, growth of a community, going from, you know, how did that come about? That that idea. Yeah, that was that was a, a two stage process. I had always wanted to write a song about the the fact that at some point in time, you know, you asked me before about thinking that one day there'd be no more survivors. I also recognized years and years ago that one day the Gadol Hadar, so to speak, <laughs> is not going to be European. He's going to be somebody who grew up collecting comic books and baseball cards and, and, and playing ball in the backyard. But 
he's going to be a serious Talmud Chacham and grow and grow and grow and become. And it's true today. You have American born Gedolim. Baruch Hashem, we still have European Gedolim, people who were born in Europe, but not too many. Right. You know, they're, 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 time has gone, gone on and those, those generations are disappearing. But so originally the idea was that, you know, the idea that somebody would be an American Gadol. And then later when they came out with the, with the uh, base, with the Gadolim card hmm. uh, phenomenon. So I took those two, the, I used the baseball card to the Gadolim card as the contrast. Very smart. And that's how, how it came about. So Mama Rachel, you also wrote. Mama Rachel. This is the story of Rachel Imani was an amazing story. It's just, it's something that, it, it, it's fascinating, fascinating. Mama Rachel, Rachel Imani, stood up to Hakadosh Baruch Hu and said, and said, how could how could it be that I I a human being have more Rachmanis than you? I was Marachim on my sister, and I gave gave away everything. I gave away my destiny, my future, and here Hakadosh Baruch Hu, you're you're standing on ceremony, you're being mockbit and. And you're you're being you're because because people served Avodah Zarah, okay, they they made a mistake, but but give in, give up, be mavata, just like me. I mean, the, the audacity of Rabbi right. Menu and uh, Kodesh Baruch Hu himself said that 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 I heard you, and we know that because of her cry, her cries, that's why she was buried there on the road on the on the side of the road, and because so she could make that. I mean, it's a fascinating story, and it resonated with me and. Yeah, the, it it's just so interesting me. to me because, like, the way I'm like getting a little teary, the way you're mm-hmm. saying it now, like, I I went to yeshivas and the, my rabbi, I'm unbelievable, but there's a certain like emotional element that you're putting into it that not not adding. Well, that's to what it. music does. Music when you when you take words that are that are well written and you you put music to it, it, it. First of all, you remember those words better because they're they're, they're associated with the tune, and you give it an ashama. You give you give you give words. I mean, that we were speaking before. I mean, if only we could hear David Amelech's songs to those beautiful words, Asher Yishev Vesech, how did he sing it? Well, it would probably inspire us to, to, to who knows what heights. Would you say you're an emotional person? <sighs> That's a good question. In some ways, yes. In some ways, no. Uh, um, I get passionate about ideas. I get passionate about... When I hear certain things and I feel that 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 there's a uh, an inspiring way to present it to others, I do get passionate about that and and, and emotional to some extent. There's a song on 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 Journeys Five that my daughter wrote. It's called "From the Ashes." It's about rebirth or or rejuvenation after after the Holocaust. And when she sang it to me the first time, I cried like a baby because, oh. but that's rare. It's very rare that I'm touched like that when I hear somebody else's music. So what made you cry? I don't know. Maybe my upbringing, maybe the, maybe the fact that I knew so many Holocaust survivors. Was it the part, maybe your daughter also like Perhaps. continuing on? And I don't think so. I no. think it was simply the, maybe my, my in-laws were Holocaust survivors. That's where she uh, picked up those, those, uh, those messages and ideas to write a song like that. She's uh, she's a young lady, and she still has has an, a real a clear idea of what the war meant and and what her her grandparents were able to do. and And she wrote that amazing song. and So, in some ways, yes. In some ways, I'm a bit stoic, but so I I mean I'm doing the interview, so I get to ask this question. Yes, you do. Um, I think you pranked the world. And I think you knew exactly what you're doing. And it's not even like one of your biggest songs, but I have to mention it. The band. Yes. That beginning of that song. I'm like, <laughs> where is this going? Well, the music itself, I have to thank Ellie Schwebel, wrote that little you know piece. Yeah. But we totally. incorporated it into the song to have this incredible music. And that one day, you know, when Mashiach comes, um, the world will be on such a spiritual plane. I guess it's the people with with spiritual qualities who will be who will be more recognized than the ones without those so all of a sudden these people who so much wanted to praise hashem with their music all of a sudden they they find that they miraculously have the talent to play incredible music and that's the that's why you did like this incredible intro and then it goes to like and then at the end we bring it back right we bring it back really beautiful so that was yeah that's well that's production more than than, than songwriting that's song production mm-hmm. so you have a song you have a you have a basic 
framework for a song and there's a message there but then you talk to an arranger you work with an arranger and you 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 try to capture the spirit of the song and, and enhance it with music around it so those are those are elements that, that that really you'll find in any music not just my music so any good producer any good arranger will will take a song and highlight it and and, and put cloak it in the most beautiful clothing so is there a, a specific performance for you that stands out above the rest of them? Yes. I, I, the, my most enjoyable performance was the year after Shlomo Kawa passed away. And I was invited to uh, perform a, uh, to do a set at, uh, I think it was Town Hall in Manhattan. So we're talking about 25 years ago, something like that, 26 years ago. And uh, I didn't have to sing any of my own songs. We <laughs> just sang Shlomo, so it was just so enjoyable. Because you're all self-conscious about your own material. And I'm getting up there and singing. I sang with Shlomo Simcha. There were some other singers there. Chaim David was there, and, 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 and the Solomon Brothers, and, mm -hmm. and, and, and C. Langsbaum. And it was just a Was beautiful. it bittersweet for you to be up there right after he passed away and seeing all that? I remember when we heard about Shlomo's Petiro was, was I think he was Nifter on a Thursday night that Shabbos by Kiddush we in Shul we, we we were singing his songs for an hour an hour and a half after David and we just sat by the Kiddush and kept singing people were crying it was it was very special listen Shlomo affected the world Shlomo was our generation's David Amalek he was a Tzinor he was a there was a, a pipeline between him and Shemayim. I think he, you know, those, those nagunim that he wrote were whispered in his ear by Malachim coming down. What message has he personally taught you? I, I think just through osmosis, you know, that a nigan is something special. A nigan, a nigan can lift you up. It can make you laugh. It can make you dance. It can make you happy. It can make you cry. It can make you think. You know, he has all those emotions in his work. And uh, also a, a niggin can be simple. doesn't have to be complex. doesn't have to be too complicated to be meaningful. There's hundreds of songs that you've put out. What, where, what songs that you haven't had a, your hand in inspires you or gets you in the right zone? You're talking about Jewish music, I presume. I, 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 we could do both. We could do both. I think, uh, look, uh, we spoke about Shlomo, his music. I, I, I don't believe I, that there's one Shlomo song that I don't like. Yes, I like some more than others, but everything he wrote was, was quality. Rav Baruch Chait's uh, Chiburim are amazing. Yossi Green has some amazing songs that I love. Yirach Mil Began is a wonderful composer. Baruch Levine today from the contemporary composer. You know, his style is, he's, he's in the modern world. He's a, he's a young, uh, very popular uh, singer. Uh, at the same time, he's got one foot in the, you know, back in the 90s and 80s because, uh, you know, he's in the yeshiva world and, and his music is innovative, but it's still, you know, there's a little bit more of the old-fashioned style to his writing, which I love. He's transitional, I think. Um, who else? Uh, Yitzhi Walder has some beautiful tunes. There's some wonderful composers. I love what's going on in Eretz Yisrael. The beautiful, beautiful ideas of Ishai Rebo and musical ideas and, 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 and Kempe. And it's just amazing stuff uh, being written. And I still love the old, old classics of the Hasidic Rebbes and, and uh, Chaim Banet. And, and so there's an awful lot of music that I love and I enjoy. I like my own stuff too. I think it's pretty, <laughs> I think it's pretty good. You listen to your stuff. I think it's pretty good. I listen when I'm in production. I listen to it carefully, you know. But once it's out, maybe I'll listen to it for a week or two after it's out, and then I usually go. put it away for two, three years before I'll really listen to it again. Because it feels fresh after two years. Because you're like, okay, it's been no, so. No, because you you listen to it so often. Uh, it's like background noise. You, it, no, it becomes almost hard to listen to it. You have to put it aside ah. for a while because you've listened to it and listened to it and listened to it. And so for a couple of weeks after it comes out, you might listen to it just to make sure that you, you know, did I do it okay? Is it good? <laughs> and then once you, you've got to move on. You've got to move away from it. Because right. It's, I guess per uh, perfectionism really is a sleep. very You big. can't sleep. You end up hearing right. it in your head and you toss and turn at night. So I uh, hear that. at least that's how... How I am.
So Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade uh, came out in 1989. And then the next Indiana Jones came out in 2008. Journeys 4 came out in 2003. Now we're 19 years later. And you're 2004, having, 18 years later. 2004. Yeah. Uh, I found Google, but I'll <laughs> someone has to correct that. Yeah, so 18 years later, was that like hi or <laughs> like? What? I really had writer's block for a number of years. I um, I tried, I tried to write songs. I I did not succeed to write anything that I felt was strong enough. I was busy. I wrote a, a book called The Season of Pepsi Myers, which for anybody out there who wants to. Uh, you know, reach out to a neighbor, to a, to a teenager, uh, a co-worker's child, or, a, you know, a young adult. It's a song about baseball, but, but it teaches the fundamentals of Yiddishkeit. It's a great way of introducing people. We can link to, it in the show notes. For yeah, to buy. link it in the show notes. And there's a, it's on, you know, it's in, on Amazon. And Baruch Hashem, over the years, we've sold quite a few copies, and people recognize that it's, it's value. It's a song, it's a book that 80% of it is baseball, but you get the hush coffee, you right. get the message. I mean, to teach, you know, unaffiliated about Yiddish guy, nobody's going to want to read that. So it's got to be a story that's compelling. And 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 I think I accomplished that with uh, some of the themes from the songs that are in the book as well. Mm. So I also wrote a Safer on Elio Anavi, right. which is published by Art Scroll. If anyone is learning Navi, uh, wants to learn about the amazing, amazing uh, Navi Elio Navi is the most incredible Navi. Live continues to live on, and uh, maybe even was Pinchas a coin. I, I just you know, the oldest living person, no no Misa going up to Shammai. It's just the whole story is incredible, as well as the Psukim in the Navi. If anyone teaches Malachim, you know it's it's a it's a good safer to have. And uh, so I did keep busy, and you know, outside of work. But uh, my children actually came to me with some material. Like I told you, my daughter wrote a song, and she wrote another song. So I had two from her that were great. And I have a son who gave me two songs. And I already had four wonderful songs. And I said, A.B., you're going to miss the boat. The album has to come out. In your head, you were done with Journeys? No, No. I was always trying. But I just, I I didn't know if it would ever happen again. You You don't know. These are gifts. Like I said, these are really... Little, little, little matanot uh, mishamayim. And, and Baruch Hashem, uh, I had a granddaughter who came, grand, uh, granddaughter came for Pesach in 2018 and, and told me a story, a wonderful story about two great Rebbes. And the story resonated with me. And, and within a week, I had a beautiful song about their story, a ballad. So I had a, a song that I was proud of and I felt would, you know, enhance the album. And uh, and then a few other songs came, and Baruch Hashem, there are going to be 14 songs on the album. Wow. And they're sung, this time in a, is, is a change for me, as I, I reached out to many of, of today's most wonderful vocalists, and uh, it, has a, it has an all-star lineup. It's got just incredible vocalists. I sing a little bit, too. I didn't want to give away everything, but... <laughs> but uh, very, very happy with with uh, the contributions that they made. I'm very grateful to them for agreeing to sing on it, and I think uh, I think the public will enjoy the diversity and the the ideas that are that are contained. On if the someone album. doesn't have a lot of time and they're like, okay, it's 14 songs, you know, it's classic. So only like, listen to one. Don't listen to 14 songs if you don't have time. Right. So which one? Oh, again, you're asking <laughs> me to, to pick. I don't. I can't. I can't. Right. They're really, they're really diverse. Some, what I, what, what, what I appreciate and enjoy very much is when I meet people who say this is my favorite song, and very often it's a different song. Right. So people, what's your favorite song on Journeys Four? Some will say The Man from Vilna. Some will say Mama Rachel. Some will say like you talked about the band. Some will talk about One Word or 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 Dreams Come True. So there's there's uh, there's songs that can resonate with different kinds of people. So far, the few people who've heard Journeys Five have, you know, I've gotten different, different responses. At the rate that you're going, does that mean your grandchildren will help you with Journey Six? <laughs> good one. That's a good one. Uh, but it's kind of serious, also. Like, are, is is this it? Give me a bracha that I shouldn't have to wait so long. I give you a bracha that you shouldn't have to wait so there long. There you go. It should be so good. 
couple of years of mitzvah. Wow. If the material's there, I'll be happy to do it. I, I mean, that's my dream to like, like you know, walk out of this and be like, it's men and men doing podcasts. Or like, I don't know, like, <laughs> I'm like, I had it. In fact, like he wrote a song because of this. Uh, that would be cool. What rhymes with podcast? Not uh, too much. Podcast. <laughs> Broadcast. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Broadcast. That's why you do podcast. what you do. There you go. Yeah. Anyway, can I know Baruch Hashem. Okay, so I. So like- then I had another child who I, I told who was a gifted songwriter. I told her you're going to be left out in the dark if you don't uh, if you <laughs> don't come pressuring. up with something. And so she came up with the song. And so five of the five of the fourteen songs are from kids of my are from my children. And uh, Mordechai Shapiro sings and and, and Avram Fried and the Eighth Day and Shalom Lemmer and uh, and Benny Friedman. And uh, I had the I, I I sang a song together with Shlomo Simcha and Baruch Levine and. It was just a blast. Joey Newcomb sings the song. It, it was just an absolute blast, you know, doing the album with the Maccabees sing a song. Uh, very, very, very beautiful, uh, soft and uplifting song. And and it's it's just, it was a, a labor of love. Baruch Hashem. For you, what's what's looking back, and Mitch, I mean, you have until 120 to go, but like looking back for you personally, what's the most enjoyable part of, all of this? Is it the making the music? Is it the impact? Is it the product? It's a great question. Look, I, like I said before, I, I, I would hope that, that I've able to enhance people's lives, not just from an entertainment basis that I gave them a distraction, but hopefully inspire them to, to grow and, and, and examine uh, the subjects that are, that are, uh, spoken about or taught in the in the in the songs in the journey songs specifically. If 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 uh, I remember Avram Fried, you know, asked me recently. He said, uh, "Which song of yours, when you heard it, made you cry?" And I told him the answer was when I saw uh, when those three three boys unfortunately were kidnapped, and and we were still hoping that it would be there would be a, a positive resolution. And, and, and there were thousands of people at the Kotel singing Achenu. When I first heard that, it made me cry because I felt that people connected to my song together with the sentiment of those words and that they felt that those that, that music was something that would bring their tefillahs closer to the Kisei HaKovot. So, so it was a very powerful moment for me. So if, if in the Hebrew Nagunim that happens, and certainly if people are... Are are grow from an English song. That's that would be the that would be the uh, the dream. The dream for me. Uh, if there's one person in history that you would like to meet, who would it be? I was I I, I met last night at the, the concert. I saw uh, Ari Hirsch, who always asks those questions. You know, three yeah, oh, for the view, so Jewish, yeah. for the Jewish view. So he says three people. You know, who would you no? I, I you give dinner? you. You don't give me three. I give you one. Wow. I don't know. I wrote a safer about Elio Anavi, so I wouldn't mind having Gilu Elio. That would be wonderful. But David Amelech would be amazing. Okay, and I don't know. What a question. Who, who, who can answer such a question? Yeah, people try. Yeah. Um, what's your favorite mitzvah? My favorite mitzvah? As of right now. <sighs> I would say my favorite mitzvah is, I'm not always successful at it, but my favorite mitzvah, I think intellectually and, and emotionally, is trying not to speak Lashon Har. I like that. And again, last question, what's the worst advice you've ever received? The worst advice? I, was it the, doing this interview or? <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 I'm just kidding. Uh, what Hopefully was the worst? <laughs> we had a great time. Uh, what was the worst advice I've, I've ever received? Boy, oh boy. That might be Lush and Hara if I answer that question. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Which is back to your favorite mitzvah, so that's, yeah. that's funny. I, I don't, uh, Baruch Hashem. I've been fortunate. I've been fortunate. I, 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 I'll tell you, I mean, I wish somebody had pushed me harder when I was younger to, to study music uh, professionally and mm-hmm. properly. I think that whatever I've been able to accomplish um, 
is despite the fact that 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 I am missing, you know, some key elements. You know, I see people around me who have uh, wonderful, wonderful musical ability that is beyond my scope, and I, I I I wish that I had had that education, but that did not happen. So not so much as bad advice. I wish I would have been pushed more in that direction when I was younger, and I didn't get that advice. Oh. Maybe okay, Robert, we're doing. Thank you so much for doing this. I Pleasure. really appreciate it. You're a great interviewer. Thank you. Thank you. All the best. Thank you so much for listening to this conversation. Wasn't that great? So if you know someone that loves A.B. Romberg, go ahead and share this episode with them. Or it could be, you know, someone that, that loves one of his songs. Go ahead and share this episode, whether it's video or audio. If you haven't yet subscribed, you hear me saying it a million times, go ahead and subscribe. You don't lose anything. If you want to unsubscribe, 10 days in, you can unsubscribe. Don't worry. You won't get annoying follow-up emails that you get from email because this doesn't work like that here. Either way, go ahead and go buy Harmony in the Home. Use code LL10. It will transform your life. So get ready for that. It's incredible. LL10 for 10% off. Go ahead and buy it. And if you... I already talked about that already subscribing. So thanks again. <laughs> Enjoy. We have incredible, incredible guests coming up. I'm not just saying that. I mean it. L'chaim. Living L'chaim.